All right, let's see here. Let's get everybody taken care of. All right. Let's see. Hopefully, everybody can hear me just fine and see me just fine. You never know with the internet. Uh, everything looks good. All right. Uh, let me shrink some windows down here so I'll be able to see everybody's chat all right Let's see if we got anybody on we do have some people on awesome sauce well uh first my name is john i'm with fnp wargamers and today we are going to be doing a video uh doing a unboxing of the warhammer 40,000 um apocalypse box and kind of do a quick review um, I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, I have been playing the Apocalypse game since, well, heck, since it came out. I want to say around 2004, 2005. I think I was stationed in Yuma, Arizona around then. Um, and I remember, I'm pretty sure it came out around 2004, 2005. Um, hope, hopefully I'm right about that. Um, it's gone through at least one other um, iteration. Um, I want to say around 2007, maybe 2008, it became, um, it, it went to, uh, gosh, what's what I'm looking for? Um, Apocalypse uh, Reloaded, I believe. I think that was it. Um, so this is, I guess, really the third edition for Apocalypse. Um, if you're not familiar with Apocalypse, I'll give you a quick rundown before we crack the box open. Um, Apocalypse is pretty much the version of Warhammer 40,000 that you want to play when you want um, to have these massive battles. You want to field your entire collection and use a lot of the models and rules that you normally can't use in what we call a match play or a narrative game because uh, of game balance issues. You don't need some big uh, three foot tall or two foot tall uh, monstrosity, a Warlord Titan in a regular game. It's going to be very unfair. So Apocalypse really uh, help, allows you to delve deep into um, the into the gameplay using everything. Now, um, my little birdie that I, I usually get my information from and I kind of pass it on to you guys uh, I want to say about two or three weeks ago, the Apocalypse in this new edition, I guess we'll call it third edition, um, it's really, man, I would say it's very similar to Epic. Uh, if you ever played Epic before, have you seen it? Uh, I believe that was 15 millimeter. Um, that was used in uh, everything at 15 millimeters, I think, don't quote me on that either eight or 15 millimeters um so your space marines were about the size of your thumb um then you had uh warlord titans were probably about three inches tall so about the size of a modern day dreadnought um and even all the way up to i believe it's the imperador titan which was a massive Warlord Titan that you could actually that actually had some buildings on some cathedrals and big guns on it. You could actually transport troops inside of it. It was it was kind of a cool um, kind of a cool unit. You might have seen uh, the pictures of the Imperator Titan and several pieces of artwork out there. Um, so actually really cool. Uh, and actually uh, one of the the main logo that's inside the uh, rule, <clears throat> goodness, excuse me, uh, in the rule book is actually a, um, the head of the Imperador Titan. And you can see in the stylized symbol, and I'll show you guys here in a little bit, uh, you can see uh, the, like the cathedrals that you would see on its shoulder pads. So really cool stuff that they got going on there. Um, so I guess we can just get right to it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, is everybody hearing me okay? Um, kind of give a little bit more time for a couple people to jump on. I don't know if you guys are hearing me just fine or seeing. Um, 
because it looks like the internet keeps my little meter here kind of keeps dipping in and out so i was just worried that um with the little storms that are going overhead that perhaps um that the feed might be cutting out if it is just type away on there let me know if you guys can hear me just fine while i take a quick drink <clears throat> so, okay, cool. Thanks, 12B. So, uh, with Apocalypse, you're going to be able to use all of your big, awesome toys, kind of like um, like a Thunderhawk, for example, um, or Warhound Titans, Warlord Titans, and Reaver Titans, the big, giant, super greater demons that they've got out there. Um, well, I appreciate that, 12B. Um, so Apocalypse is still going to be a, a very cool thing to play, especially if you got your big collection, you want to get out there and just have some big, massive, pointless battle where you're showing off all your cool toys. Um, like me and my friends, we would used to get together and do a cookout, uh, a couple steaks on the grill, baked potatoes. I mean, the, the whole works and really it was just a chance to sit around and eat big giant steaks and drink some beer and throw some dice with our plastic toy soldiers. Um, and that's pretty, I think that's really kind of what you do with Warhammer in the first place. If you're not doing that, then you might be doing it wrong. All right. So let me get to it. Um, first up, let me make sure my camera's working here. All right. Perfect. So this is the box. It is a pretty big, and thick box uh, weighs uh, actually weighed it earlier it's like th almost uh, three and a half pounds and uh, inside of it's kind of a lot of cool things so let me crack it open um, and I'll show you the insides of uh, this box <laughs> yeah it's like Texas gaming for sure <laughs> um, I'll pull some things out and then I want to show you guys the inside of the box because um, where GW could have just tossed everything in and just let it, everything just bounce around and you just, um, well, just like anything else that they box up, it just, you know, you end up using a box to transport miniatures or something to a game. Um, they actually made this, they, they designed a, a little bit of a tray inside of here so you can store your dice, your asset cards, which are like 300 of them, uh, tokens, even your rule book. So in a way, this box, it's a little bit of sturdier construction. Um, I would recommend maybe putting some masking tape down or some tape on the sides to really hold it together. But it's going to be a good uh, companion to take around with you to um, an apocalypse game. And if you're worried about, well, I'm already lugging a bunch of crap around. I don't want to lug more. I mean, to be honest, if you're going to go play apocalypse, you're probably going to be making two or three trips to your car. So having one more box isn't going to hurt you. So, um, inside are a number of things, and uh, we'll start with, um, so there's going to be two of these uh, sheets, these cardboard cutout sheets, um, and it's that thick, uh, heavy-duty cardboard, and inside of this is going to be all of your tokens. Now, these are your wound tokens, um, or your blast tokens, sorry. Uh, the blast tokens, uh, these are actually nice little... Uh, objective markers. So if you don't have objective marker, this is actually um, your chance to have some really cheap, uh, easy to use objective markers. Or even even if you do have some, it would be advantageous to go ahead and pop them out because you never know. A lot. I know a lot of people will go to events and they're like, oh, I forgot my dice. I forgot my, um, my objective markers, whatnot. So having this extra little set just tossed in your go bag, it's probably to your advantage. So there's two of these sheets in there. I'm trying not to damage it uh, because this is actually my employee set. Uh, he's kind enough to let me uh, dig through this for you guys. So I, I really appreciate that, Ronnie. Um, so actually what's on these sheets is the large blast markers. I'll get into all that in a little bit. Uh, the other sheet that they have is uh, a whole bunch more markers that I don't know exactly what they are, um, but we'll get to that. Um, I think some of these are command 
uh, token. Nope, no, these are actually wound markers. Okay, yeah, these are the wound markers, and on the flip side of it is the critical wound markers. Once again, we'll get into all that and what the rest of these little snazzy tokens actually mean. Uh, so, up oh, there's actually one more set of two sheets. And this is where you have the variety of command tokens um, and some more um, these markers right here. I'll double check the rule book, but I'm fairly certain those are the out of command um, tokens. But these are your three different command or the, the different command tokens that you've got access to. And I think that's yeah, that's what these uh, ones on the side are. You have three different kinds and I'll be getting into those. You have advanced. Um, I believe it's basically fire um, targeted aim or aiming something like that and then the fight one we'll get into all that in just a moment and I'll show them back off to you guys so you get two sheets of each of those and so you can split them up between you and your opponent so whenever you guys bust them out um, if you're not used to having so many different tokens and uh, a lot of games workshop games are starting to lean that way um, it's a good idea to baggy them up um, that way it'd be easier for you to break them out. So also inside this box, um, as usual with anything Games Workshop puts out for a game, um, get a bunch of dice. This looks like two, four, six, eight, about 12 dice, uh, six siders. And if you have not been paying attention to the Apocalypse update, they also are including these 12-sided dice. It looks like, uh, yep, about a dozen of these 12 large 12 sided dice all right and so basically you and your opponent can split them up now those are going to be used to make uh, your initiative rolls which we'll get to and your saving throws which uh, once again we're going to get to that in just a little bit but you get a, a hefty sum of that um then the thing that really makes this box weigh so much are these uh apocalypse these uh asset cards and this is the stack of cards that you're getting there's 300 cards now i haven't cracked them open yet obviously they're still uh shrunk or shrink wrapped um but as i'm going through here just looking at the bottom cards i can see that there are specific ones like for the necrons uh we've got tyranid hive fleet and even once for the Adeptus Custodes. So I'm going to um, crack these open. So what I can tell you about these cards is that everybody during the gameplay, uh, it, on your turn, you get to draw a number of these asset cards. And they're just neat little tricks, uh, little twists, um, and special abilities that you can play during uh, certain phases of the game. Um, even letting you kind of violate some of the regular phases where, say, you're only allowed to move and shoot in this phase. Well, now this allows you to move, shoot, and maybe move again. Um, and there's 300 of them, so I'm not going to review them all. I'm really hoping you guys will understand that. If not, um, well, just go out and buy the box yourself and re read all 300 of these. So what I don't know is... Games Workshop put out a number of asset cards based on your faction. Uh, some of them are data cards. There's some asset cards in there. And, of course, um, a little quick reference sheet for a faction, um, your faction ability. Every faction has a special ability. So I'm going to crack one of these open real quick here. Um, just I'm curious. And, yeah, this looks like, wow. Wow. Um, so this stack of about, uh, about 20 cards, it's all for um, Tyranids. Um, it's all their special abilities from psychic, special psychic powers to abilities like Shadows in the Warp, increasing uh, Synapse range. So some pretty cool stuff there. Orcs got their special abilities here. Pulsar Rockets, those are back. Um, special tactic cards <laughs> uh, then we got tau coordinated fire arcs um oh grot shields so 
it looks like you're not going to have to worry about strat your uh, army stratagems because um, it looks like a lot of them have become these asset cards. Uh, a lot, a lot more to read on about that. Ooh. Ooh, almost just sent that tumbling. So yeah, it looks. I I'm going to find out for sure, and I'll post up um, on the Facebook page tomorrow, or probably actually probably Saturday. But I'm fairly certain that what we are seeing right here is what you will actually get um, if you want your own, um, if you if you grab your own uh, oh, faction set of cards. I have a feeling that that's exactly what you're going to get. In fact, I could probably. All right, so there's about 20 cards here, and I'm betting the Gene Steeler one, there's about 20 also. Um, and if I remember reading earlier, is that you get um, 41 cards in the asset pack. So that is that that one card is probably your faction card, and then the rest are the asset cards. So I'm going to find out for you guys because I'm, I'm sure you are just as curious as I am. So uh, before I start putting these back in here, um, let me show you the inside of this because it's actually going to be kind of important in a way. So this is the inside. As you can see, there's these rows here. And then you got your little uh, trays there. Now these rows, um, if I'm guessing correctly, that these rows are designed for you to actually put in your uh, the faction cards. So we're going to test this out real quick here. Um, I have a feeling that they're going to fit perfectly. They sure do. So that's what that tray is for. Uh, I'm not going to do it because everything is going to come tumbling out, but this thing is designed for you to put your uh, individual faction cards in their corresponding slot. So um, about those faction cards, because I'm about ready to dive into the book, those are not faction cards, but these asset cards. These, you will be building a 30 card deck with these and you'll be drawing a number of cards uh, each turn uh, based on the number of warlords and war masters and any other special abilities you might have. All right, but we'll get into that in just a second. Uh, so that's the uh, interior of the box. Um, Let's see here. Let's check out chat here. Somebody actually just sent me a message that they can't get on for some reason. Interesting. Okay. Well, I can't help you if you can't get onto YouTube, guys. Um, so let's get to the interior of the book. Now, this book is about 100 pages. Um, it doesn't have the normal... Um, glossy cover with uh, uh, fantastic artwork and everything. But what it does give the impression is like a, uh, well, as I say down here, field manual. Um, for those of you who've been in the military, this has that very generic look on the outside, um, that your basic military manual. So kind of cool that they're doing that. So I'm gonna show you the inside of the cover and this is that um, Imperator Titan uh, symbol and head and everything I was talking about. And you can see the, uh, the archways and the crenellations and everything on top. So let's see here. Yeah. So I think that's going to be like the main symbol. So for Apocalypse, so you see whenever you crack open any of your codexes, you're going to see, you know, like your space ring symbol. There's going to be something similar, knights, whatnot. So one of the first things that I noticed when I cracked open this book was um, lots of, I think there's a lot of wasted space in this. Um, yes, this book is thick, 120 pages. Um, but not all of it is rules. I would say close to 20 page, uh, I'm gonna say about, uh, let's say about 30 pages is uh, nothing but pictures, um, the typical artwork, that you guys see uh, campaign information, famous battles, um, how to play a game, uh, the thought process uh, or the design of the game, 
um, kind of like what you're supposed to be doing when you're playing this. So a verse uh, um, where you would play, say, match play, and it's very tight, very um, rule specific. You, um, it's very organized. This one, Apocalypse, is a little bit more free playing. So you can really get a little crazy with not only what armies that you're going to be playing with and what big giant models you'll have um, or the, the type of table size you're going to be playing on, but you're going to be able to uh, mess with the environment, um, mess with how, you know, what type of world you're on. Are you on a death world, a volcanic world, or an industrial world? And there's special rules for all that. We'll get to that. Um, lots of other little twists and circumstances that you can add to make this game uh, a lot more intense. So it's really, if you've been playing match play for so long, this is a good chance for you to um, kind of step back and just remember why you got into this hobby. I mean, if you got into it for strictly match play and tournament play, well, you know what, take a chance and uh, play this game the way it was meant to be, kind of laid back, um, beer and pretzel style where you can sit there and just uh, play with your big plastic toy soldiers, roll some dice, play around with your, uh, hang out with your friends and joke around and uh, make stupid pew, pew, pew sounds, <laughs> uh, voiceovers and everything for your commanders and whatnot. And really just kind of, well, I can't do it, but really kind of let your hair down and just enjoy this game for what it's what it's meant to be. And that's simply just rolling dice and playing with a bunch of plastic toy soldiers. Um, and do yourself a favor with those contrast paints that are out, man. Get your stuff painted before you start playing the game. Uh, it's 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 a it's a courtesy to your friends. It's a courtesy to your opponents. Um, and I don't know. It's it, it just looks so much better. So just paint your models, guys. <laughs> I will suggest you guys have fun. I I will accept that dare. I'll accept that challenge. And I will have words with anybody that have a problem with that. All right. So let's get to um, the game. So I meant, I showed you earlier the different markers. I'm going to show you um, kind of what they talked about earlier. Um, so they got a page here with the, with the markers. Those triangular ones I talked about earlier, those are the command ones. And if your unit's out of command, the different um, orders that you're going to uh, issue for your detachments, um, the actual wound counters and critical wounds. And then down below is the blast markers. That's going to symbolize when your models have gotten hit, but before you um, resolve damage. Um, and unlike regular games of Warhammer 40,000, you do not resolve the damage immediately after you um, are, your unit is hit or you've rolled to hit a unit, um, rolled to wound them and all that jazz. Uh, everything else is resolved in a different phase and it's supposed to make the game seem more little realistic and in a way speeds it up a little bit. And so, we're, but we're getting there, just bear with me. Um, so, if you are familiar with Warhammer 40,000, and you should be familiar with detachments, um, but we're going to get to that. I'm just I'm trying to go through this whole thing here. So something that they uh, walk you through here before you even get to building your armies and whatnot, uh, it walks you through everything about data sheets, command assets, how these work. Um, just well, just briefly about um, command assets. So like I said earlier, you're going to build a deck of 30 command assets. Um, that don't contain any duplicate cards. Um, most of these are, re most, it says right here, most uh, command assets are restricted by faction and it only can be included in your deck if at least one of the units in your army has a faction keyboard that matches it. So no, um, no running an orc army and then having space marine faction asset cards. Um, if for some reason you and your opponent are using the same set of cards to create your decks, you can put any cards you both want to use, um, and put them off to the side. These cards are shuffled and dealt one at a time to the players before they select the remaining cards. 
So it sounds like if there's um, any generic cards or anything, or if you're both are playing orcs and you're wanting to use the same cards um, it, uh, and you guys don't have your own individual set of cards, it sounds like you'll have to actually share those cards or randomly determine who gets what. So that could suck. Um, so another thing that they kind of talk about here before we even get set up is the battlefield. And I've had a couple of people ask about this. Um, so how you set up your table, normally you'd um, say match play games, you do a six by four table for at about 2000 points or so and go at it for about two, two and a half hours. All right, so now you're not gonna be worrying about 2000 points or anything like that unless you get to these big games, these really massive games. So Apocalypse uses uh, power level. And it's not the power, same power level, I don't, at least I don't think, uh, that you see in your codex. Um, you're going to need, actually, I'm very certain that it's not the same because they have entirely different um, unit cards, excuse me, um, that you can actually find for free on the, the Warhammer community page. And you go to the Apocalypse um, section, find your army, and you can actually download for free your the different units that you have in your book and it talks about the power level the special rules everything that they have um, so the smallest game for apocalypse is 300 to 450 and it looks like it goes up uh, about 150 for each level so at the lowest level 300 to 450 power level is played on a six by six and the average length is up to three hours is what they're saying these are suggestions if you guys are taking longer uh, it doesn't matter but it should only be about three hours uh then like i said it jumps uh, about 150 each time after that so the next level is for 451 to 600 um and the board keeps getting uh longer so it goes by six by eight by ten by twelve etc um, here they got it maxed out, or not maxed out, but you can actually keep increasing by that 150 points. So 750 to 900 power level, that's a 6 by 12, up to 6 hours of gameplay. Um, they also will go into uh, talking about the terrain. Um, it looks like you can play with as much or as little terrain as possible. But in general, they recommend having one feature on the battlefield for every two foot by two foot area. So I don't know if that's a terrain feature. Yes, yeah, it says terrain feature. Um, that's a little sparse uh, in my opinion, but once again, I think they want these games to go by fast. So where a match play game, you're looking at a really quick game, um, almost uh, where squads versus squads, or a very small detachment um, battling out. Well, small being like anywhere from 30 to 120 models um, versus these larger battles, which are probably fielding 100 to several hundred models. So um, having a lot of terrain, probably not ideal. That make that would make the game go by a lot, uh, a lot longer. So uh, anyways, so you have another thing where you're nominating commanders and then uh which are warlords and then of course your war master um so commanders is whenever you deploy a unit each player has to nominate one unit in each of their detachments uh to be its commander and commander uh, a detachment commander um if it has a keyword character that unit is a warlord and gains the warlord keyword which allows you to generate command assets these are very important. You can have up to generate up to 10 command assets a, a turn or a, a, yeah, a turn. Um, and then you select a war master um, pretty much the same way. And then the war master um, allows you once again, draw another command asset, but he also gets a special warlord trait. We'll get to that in, in just a little bit. So if you've been uh, paying attention to what's going on with uh, the oh, um, a little updates they've been doing on Warhammer community page. You've been you've probably seen the um, the turn description. So what or how the game plays the turn sequence? That's what I'm looking for. Um, it's right here in front of me. So you have three or four phases. Sorry, you have your initiative phase, your order phase, 
your action phase and damage phase. And that damage phase is that when I was talking about that um, has happened after both you and your opponent have done all their actions. The initiative phase is really easy to get through. You both take a D12, roll it off. Whoever has the highest gets to go first. Um, yeah, and if, the, if somehow you guys tie, the tie actually goes to the player who finished or deploying their army first. So a couple of advantages there. If you, you know, less model count gives you a slight advantage, but I mean, the chances of that, uh, I'm not going to sit there and calculate. I'll leave that to my friend Chris. Um, so the next thing you have to do is the orders phase. Now, the order phase has several several steps you have to fall down or go through. So first thing is you're going to mark um, any units that are um, out of command. And the out of command is any unit that is 12 inches or more, or sorry, outside of a 12 inch um, range of their commander. Um, they're marked out of command and um, they're, it looks like they can still operate normally, but um, they're in danger of being routed and removed from battlefield. And what, we'll, we're going to get to that, but if I re remember correctly, if they take damage and they're still out of the command range, um, they are at the end of the at the end of the damage phase, they will be routed or or destroyed outright. You just are going to remove them from the battlefield. So when we say that this game is going to be quick, we really mean it. So the next step is to set up any reinforcements. Uh, in this game, if you haven't set up your reinforcements by the end of turn four, they are uh, considered destroyed and lost assets for you, um, possibly a bonus of points to your opponent. So make sure that you remember to bring all of your reinforcements in by the end of turn four. Uh, see here, you're going to generate your command assets, and this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, you draw the topmost card, and it's uh, one command asset for each warlord in your army that is on the battlefield. Um, and, and that includes warlords that are in terrain um, or that are uh, command or garrisoning defensible terrain features or they're inside of transports. Um, and you keep that secret from your opponent if you wish, you don't have to, there's nothing big about it. Um, and of course you'll draw one for your war master. Now, if your warlord or war master is off the table, you're not going to be able to generate that card. So remember that um, when you're playing. And then you guys get to the end of this phase, the end of the order phase, uh, where you issue the orders. Now, there's three orders. Um, so what I'm thinking is going to happen uh, from what I'm gathering is you're at best, you're going to be fielding three detachments because um, there's only three orders that you're going to be issuing a turn. So there's the advance uh, order, and that's basically... Um, you make one move action after that, you can make either a shoot or a fight action. So I think that's very similar to being, uh, that kind of like a basic, um, or the most basic of your actions. So move and then do a shoot or close combat. Uh, then you got aim fire, which, uh, basically, and when you issue this, it's for the entire detachment. So if you have a detach, um, say a super heavy detachment with three knights in it, whatever order that you issue that detachment, that's what they're gonna, that's what they're gonna be doing. So you're not gonna be running off with a knight over here and knight over there. I mean, that's they're all operating um, with the same um, order. So this one's not gonna be doing close combat um, if the rest of them are doing this, like aimed fire, which is um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so aim fire carries out this order. Each unit in the detachment can make either a shoot action or one fight action. In either case, while making this action, add one to the hit roll for attacks with ranged weapons and subtract one from hit rolls for attacks made with melee weapons. So if you don't intend to do any moving, aim fire is the best one, uh, especially if you're locked up in the combat or you got stuff that sits far in the back and you want them to unleash hell. And then there's the assault one. The assault one's kind of cool, especially for you assault heavy armies. Uh, you make one move action, and you double each unit's move characteristic while doing so. At the end of all that, uh, you you will fight in the um, in the fight phase. So, 
that's every unit in your in that detachment will do basically do a double move um, or double their move characteristic. So if you've got those really super fast armies and you're wanting to get into close combat fast, uh, especially you guys that run around those night gallants or probably the uh, what's the new one coming out? The uh, Chaos Knight. Uh, um, oh boy, Desecrator maybe or the Rampager. Whichever one is the close combat one, or the new Warhounds or War Dogs, or whatever they're called, the Armager version of the uh, uh, Warglaive are going to be coming out. These are going to be ideal units that you're going to want to send down range. All right, so that's the order stage. Um, yeah, I know you're messing with me, Denim. I'll wait till wait wait till next weekend at Warzone Houston. I'll show you what it's like to get messed with. Um, so that's the order phase. That's after the initiative phase, guys. So up after that is the action phase. And this is where you're going to start doing all your dice rolls and such. So um, after you and your opponent take turns uh, issuing your orders, uh, it goes to the action phase. And starting with the player who has initiative, the players alternate selecting a detachment, not units. Um, but their individual detachment, uh, those massive detachments, sorry, not the individual units. And you will do, you'll basically execute those orders. So if you did the advanced order on your detachment of knights, that's where you're gonna do the move action and then engage in the shoot or fight, ac uh, fight action. And that's exactly how they do it. Move action, shoot action, fight action, just like a normal game. So once you're done, uh, activating your uh, detachment. That's all the units that, in, that are in that detachment. So if you got a brigade, that means as soon as you're done uh, executing that order with your brigade level, um, then your opponent, he goes. So the bigger your army, uh, the longer the, <laughs> the game's gonna take. So if you got like 200 orc boys, which I'm pretty sure my friend Clint Mays does, uh, that's gonna be a little crazy and I'll be able to sit back and just kind of relax while he has to do all that. Um, so the move action they go into, it's, if you play Warhammer 40,000, then everything looks the same. Um, and just as I mentioned earlier, um, in that at the beginning of the orders phase, when you mark a, a unit uh, out of command, if you manage to, during your uh, move action in the action phase, get back in range of um, your commander, then you remove those those uh, markers and you don't have to worry about the detrimental effects of that. Um, shoot action is just the same way, guys. Um, you'll be using um, the normal D6s to roll and see if you hit. Um, when you guys take a look at the free downloads for your units um, on the webpage, you will see um, that their to hit rolls are the, pretty much the same thing. Marines still need three ups. That means, uh, for those of you not familiar, on a three or higher on the on a six sided dice, you're going to be successful um, as long as there's no modifiers, negative modifiers. Um, what, where that's going to come in differently, uh, that most of you are not uh, familiar with, is the damage phase. Um, well, real quick before I go on. Um, you're going to see something different with the number of attacks your units can make. So let's say right now in a match play, Space Marines, a 10-man unit of, of Space Marines would make, uh, if they were rapid firing, I think uh, 20 attacks uh, on normal. Um, your units in this game are going to have a different number of attacks. So you're not going to be rolling the 20 dice, or if you've got, uh, God forbid, you have... Um, Orc Ludas and you're rolling 75 shots. Uh, you're not gonna be rolling as many shots because it's not about um, the shooting and damaging mechanics are slightly different. But just take a look at your unit profile and you'll see what I'm talking about. Because you'll be making a number of attacks based on uh, the number of attacks of the weapon and the unit. Okay, so damage phase is where we, um, we're talking about. Uh, so we, I mentioned real quick earlier about the um, out-of-command markers. So when you get to the damage phase, and this is after both you and your opponent have completely gone through um, 
activated all your detachments based on the orders. Um, you start the damage phase. Um, and before you, this is kind of a neat thing, uh, before you start um, damaging any other units, you actually have to start with your, uh, and this is very important, your super heavy units. They have to be damaged before any other unit. Um, and when these things are damaged and they blow up, it is very, it is very, very bad when they when they die because every unit within six inches of that um, are damaged on it. Uh, let's see here. Each time a super heavy unit is destroyed, the controlling player rolls one d12 before removing it from the battlefield. On a ten up or a ten plus, that unit explodes or collapses in such a way to crush those nearby. Um, every unit nearby gets a blast marker next to their unit. Um, that it's within six inches. And so if they've already got blast markers, you could end up wiping out um, several of your units just by that blowing up. So that's kind of a cool feature that they want you to start with um, the super heavies first. So that means these games could go by quicker, especially if you have uh, like Warlord Titans and Reavers and such. We were warned by um, a GW employee, I'm not gonna mention his name because I don't want to get him in trouble. But he said, be very, super, very cautious around the big Titans. I don't, I don't mean like the Night Titans, but I'm talking like the Warhounds, the Reavers, the Warlords, or any of those big monstrous things that have the super Titanic explosions. So um, be very cautious. So going back to check uh, the beginning of the damage phase. Now, um, if a unit has an out of command marker, that unit is autumn uh, when you're when you go into the damage phase, and this is where it's very important to pay, pay attention to where your commander is. If you have an out of command marker on a unit, and um, and it's the damage phase, that unit is routed. You're going to remove it from uh, from play, and all markers next to it. It's basically been uh, destroyed because um, it's lost lost in its commit. I guess it's just. Uh, it's a way of descri or describing that the unit has lost uh, com communications and they've been totally annihilated from all the random explosions. I don't know. It's kind of a weird rule. I'm not too thrilled about that. I could understand if the unit was damaged, maybe. Um, but yeah, if you have an out of command marker, uh, that unit is routed um, during the, at the beginning of the da damage phase right after you deal with super heavy. So that that kind of sucks. So be very uh, cautious where your commander is and where your units are. Make sure they're within 12 inches, holy crap. All right, so after that, you're going to be, um, it goes to making saving throws. If you if you manage to have damaged units, um, you make one saving throw for each blast marker that is next to the unit. Um, so if it's that large blast marker that I showed you guys earlier, then, and I'll, I'll double back and I'll explain the blast markers. Um, you're actually rolling a D6. And a lot of times with these some of these units, you're not gonna be able to make actually make a saving throw. So if you have a large blast marker next to Grotz, I think Grotz were a, a 10 um, armor save, which means uh, you could not successfully make that with a D6 roll. Uh, you could with a D12, but if you have a large blast marker next to them, they're they're just going to be annihilated. They're going to take damage. Um, there are two kinds of blast markers. Let me uh, back up for that in the damage phase, um, small and large. And um, if there's a if there see here, uh, you place one or more blast markers next to unit. Uh, do so one at a time, as follows. If there is no small blast marker, you're going to put a small one. If there's already a small one, you're going to put a large blast one. And I think that's just trying to show the weight of fire that is coming down on your unit. So that's uh, the more markers that you have, that is obviously bad because that's going to make it very hard for you to make those saving throws, um, especially when you're, like I said, your saving throw could be, say, an 8 plus, and you have to roll a D6 because you have two large blast markers. Well, it guess what, that unit's gonna take those two wounds. Um, so after making saving throws for each blast marker next to the unit, if it has not been destroyed, you will take a morale test next. 
Um, and let me uh, be clear here. A one is always a, an unmodified one is always a failure and unmodified six is always a success. Same thing with the one and the 12. So just remember that. Um, it, with the exception of morale test, uh, unmodified roll of one always passes. Otherwise, um, if you fail, uh, the test has failed and one damage marker is placed next to that unit. Um, that kind of represents the unit fleeing from the battlefield in terror, having to abandon their positions, or um, in either case, you remove all the blast markers from the from next to that unit. Um, let's see here. Critically damaged, if the number of damage markers next to the unit is equal to or more than half its wound characteristics, it is critically damaged. Um, so uh, like a unit of 10 Marines, uh, say Primaris Marines, I think they have two wounds. So if they manage to uh, take two wounds and they save one and fail the other, uh, they're going to be critically damaged. And that means that um, their attack characteristic is halved. Uh, subtract one from hit rolls with heavy weapons. So it's pretty bad to, I mean, it's already bad enough when you lose a unit. But when uh, if they end up being critically wounded, that's just as bad because now they're going to be um, not as effective as, as fi in fighting. All right. So that's really kind of how the phase goes down. I'm not going to go through the entire, um, they, they put an example here. I'm not going to read them and bore you guys. So just re quick recap. The turn is basically the initiative phase, the order phase, and that the order phase is where you actually um, issue your orders, generate your command assets, and whatnot. Uh, then the action phase, that's when you activate uh, your, you take turns activating your individual detachments, your detachment, then his, yours, his, or hers. Um, you both take turns to activating your detachments and whatever those orders are, so move, shoot, and or fight. Um, and during those times, you're act that's when you'll actually be using your asset cards. There are some times um, that you might be using your assets out of out of phase um, during your opponent's phase. So just remember that. And then you get your damage phase. That's when you start seeing uh, if your super heavies blow up first. Remember this, guys. If you have a super heavy, it has to have its damage resolved first uh, before you start resolving everybody else's. Um, and this is also when you see if your units run away. Um, let me take a drink here. All right. So as I'm looking here, they got they go into terrain features um, about garrison build garrison buildings. Um, the same stuff that you're if you play Warhammer Forty Thousand, it's the same stuff that you're you're already used to. Um, what, what terrain features do? Blocking line of sight. Um, what? How many people can shoot up out, out of a building? Whatnot. So. Um, it's going to go into uh, the mission section. Uh, talk, well, actually talking to you about kind of how to play the game. It kind of gives you a quick breakdown of apocalyptic missions. And if you are familiar with Warhammer 40,000, um, which I'm hoping so, because if you're jumping into Warhammer 40,000 straight into Apocalypse without playing the regular game, uh, it's going to be kind of a daunting, um, daunting task because Apocalypse is designed for big, massive armies, guys. So remember that if you're just going to jump knee deep in. Um, so they kind of talk about data sheets. Now on the data sheets, um, you're going to see something a little different. You're going to see something called SAP and SAT. And that's um, shoot against personnel, shots against personnel, and shots against tanks. And that's Basically, when you're uh, shooting uh, vehicles and trying to wound them or shooting um, uh, infantry, that right there tells you what you need to wound. So, for example, um, so a drop pod, we'll use a drop. They have an example here. It's a drop pod. It is a four power level unit. It has a ballistic skill of three. You guys will remember that. has a two wounds and a save of six plus. So 
if you already know in regular match play, the drop pod has, actually has a three plus armor save and more than two wounds. And actually, I think it's ballistic skills worse than a three plus. It could be. Um, then it has, I'm just going to give you one example of its weapons um, Storm Bolter. It's got a new type called Small Arms, same range that you're familiar with. Uh, attacks one. So, as you n know, in Warhammer 40,000 8th edition, Storm Bolters are actually at four attacks at 24 inch range. Uh, but under Apocalypse rules, you're only making one. Um, against personnel, you are going to wound them on a nine plus. So it doesn't matter what, um, or how badass, how super tough an army is or a unit is, um, you're always going to wound on a nine plus unless they have a special rule that alters that. So it's normally a strength four versus say a, uh, toughness six creature. You need a six plus, um, this on a 12 sided dice, you need a, a nine plus. So not that great to damage personnel, but. Um, you have, what is that, about a 30-some-odd percent chance, 33% chance um, of damaging an opponent. So in a way, a little bit better than, um, is it 33%? Yeah, I'd say about 33%. Uh, then getting your about 17.4%, I think, with uh, that normal Storm Bolter. And then, of course, the uh, damage against a tank is a 10+. plus. So a little, a little bit more difficult, but you could still wound. Um, everything has a chance to wound in this game, just like Warhammer 40,000 normal. So just remember that. Um, all right, so let's go over here real quick. Uh, they talk about aura abilities that characters have. Um, let's see here. Factions. Ah, detachments. So if you're familiar with the detachments, the battalion, the spearhead, outrider, all of those... Um, they are the exact same thing, exact same rules, except for uh, you're going to see some different things about command benefits. Um, yeah, instead of knowing, well, I'm going to get three freaking uh, command points for this, um, you, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, you're not worried about command uh, or uh, um, command points. Uh, they do have one other special detachment in here. It's called the ad hoc detachment. I don't think that's an 8th edition, guys. Um, but I'm just going to read this verbatim. In the event that there are units in your army that are impossible to fit into any of the detachments described on these pages while adhering to the restrictions and limitations described in this section, uh, then your army can include a single ad hoc detachment that contains all such units from your army. This detachment has no restrictions and no command benefits. In addition, the commander um, of that detachment never gains the warlord key trait, even if they are a character. So when I was discussing this with somebody earlier, um, let's say that you've already maxed out your two detachments and you're pretty excited that you got your Primaris Marines and your knight detachment, but you ran out of slots because you have, for some reason, eight knights. And you also have an Inquisitor, and you have some Legion of the Dam models that you want to field. So an ad hoc detachment would actually be ideal. You could throw the Inquisitor in there, the two units of um, Legion of the Dam you have, and those last two remaining knights. Toss them into the ad hoc detachment. It doesn't care about how many HQs you have, elites, anything like that. Just toss them in there, and now you have it. There's no benefit... Uh, to have it, and there's not necessarily a detriment. You're just not getting anything out of it, but now you can field it as a detachment. So you can still play with all your big toys. All right, so that's the detachments. Let me check the time here. Oof. Okay, so um, uh, let's see here. All right, so beyond, uh, beyond all of that, they talk about um, special, some special rules like anti-air, supersonic, supercharging, your weapons, all your normal special rules that you have. Um, they're very self-explanatory. Rapid fire, you double the attack characteristic of the weapon. Um, which fire, you can reroll wound rolls for uh, attacks made with this weapon. So 
uh, they talk about um, multiplayer games, how to work that out. Um, and then they get into your faction abilities. Now, faction abilities are all the different abilities, that, but no abilities are gained if the only shared faction keyword is Imperium, Chaos, Aldari, or Tyranids. So that's where those ad hoc units will, um, the detachments will come into play. So I'll read off a couple here. Um, Adeptus Astartes, their faction ability, reroll failed morale tests, which that's actually kind of huge especially if you are um, uh, taking lots of damage with your units. Um, let's see, Custodes. Ah, this is the one I thought was pretty awesome. Adeptus Custodes units in this detachment do not suffer penalties for being critically damaged. So that means they will continue to fight on at full strength. Um, since knights are kind of a big deal right now, Questorus, Traitorus units in the detachment become, oh, one of them, becomes a character who can be a warlord. Um, in, dish, in addition, this unit has a warlord trait, even though they are not your war master. Um, wow, that is huge. So you could, with your army, you have the the, knight, the traitor knights or the chaos knights. Man, you can have your war master with his war master trait, and then you can nominate one of these uh, knights to be a warlord for that detachment and they get a War Master trait on top of that. We're going to get into those in, in just a moment. Um, and it looks like oh, uh, Imperial Knights get to do the same thing. Harlequins subtract one to hit rolls for attacks that target... Oh, any attacks that target Harlequins, uh, minus one to hit. That's huge. Um, let's see, Chaos Space Marines, where are you at? Uh, there we go. Uh, Reroll wound rolls of one for attacks made by uh, members of this unit. Hey, what's going on, Kevin? Um, Kevin does Tyranid High Fleet. So Tyranids, their faction abilities, um, they, oh, wow. They automatically pass morale tests while they are within 12 inches of, of a friendly synapse unit. That is, <laughs> ooh, man, that, that's going to, that's kind of big. That's actually really huge, especially when you could end up getting uh, um, wiped out right on time. I started I started like an hour ago, Kevin. <laughs> Where you been, man? Um, so I was talking about War Master traits. So this is where those the, the knights are, both different types of knights are going to come out on top. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, the War Master traits. I'm not going to go through them all, but some of them are actually kind of <laughs> kind of huge. Um, let's see here. Relic Force Field. Once per damage phase, you can roll 1d12 for one of this unit's saving throws instead of a d6. That's actually really good. Um, uh, Reroll wound rolls um, for attacks made by the character when you're targeting uh, other characters. Uh, increase your command asset hand limit by two while this unit is alive. That means you can go up to 12 cards in a turn. That, uh, that That's actually huge. Add one to wound rolls. Um, so these are extra um, little warlord traits that you're going to have. So you're not going to be doing your normal um, Space Marine warlord traits. You're going to be you're going to be doing these war master traits, and it's only going to apply to one character. So um, one, one character in all of your detachments will actually be um, your War Master. Um, they have to have the Warlord keyword, which means they also have to have the character keyword to be your um, War Master. So keep that in mind. You can't just nominate some little grot to be a Warlord or to be your Warlord and your War Master and then hide him way in the back where nobody could see him because it's such a small model or anything like that. We're not going to be able to do that. All right. So um, they're going to go into multiplayer games, campaign trees, and then they go into uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six. Uh, so total of seven missions that they have access to. 
And if you've played the original Apocalypse or you even still have your um, original Apocalypse book, a lot of these missions are the same um, basic mission, um, including Exterminatus. This is a really devastating, um, a devastating mission if you ever play it. Uh, you start rolling a dice um, every every turn. You roll a D3, plus, and then you add your turn number. And depending on what you get, uh, there will be an orbital bombardment, virus bombs, or cyclonic um, explosions um, that happen on a battlefield. So that means the games will speed up ridiculously quick. Now, if you're not happy about these missions because they're – they kind of have a narrative feel and they have their own special rules and special deployments um, and are kind of, some of them are designed for attacker versus defender, um, uh, really heavy narrative feel to them. They actually have a mission, mission generator. Uh, so they have pretty much all the same deployment types you're used to, spearhead assault, dawn of war, hammer anvil, vanguard strike, frontline assault, and search and destroy. Um, or table quarters as it used to be. So you can roll randomly, get your mission. Um, then um, there is a separate uh, table. It's an objective table. Um, and this is the object. The objective is what they're, the, um, yeah, the, object the attacker rolls the D12, looks up the results on the objective table. This is the objective for the battle. And, well, there's actually 12 different uh, things here. Everything from place one objective marker at the center of the battlefield uh, to each player scores one victory point for each time an enemy warlord is destroyed and one additional if the war master is destroyed. So a variety of different objectives. So you might not necessarily be playing playing for capture and hold six or seven objectives. You're gonna, you might have a very um, narrow focused one uh, like Show of force. Each player scores one victory point each time an enemy detachment is completely destroyed. If the detachment was a super heavy, <laughs> if the detachment was a super heavy detachment, you score three victory points instead if you wipe them out. So, um, a big variety. Now, here's the other thing: is when you're generating these mission guys, and this is where we're going to get to some different um, tactics or different gameplays. Is the attacker is going to roll on a chart. It's called the twist. Um, this is a special rule that applies to them uh, for the duration of the battle. And then the defenders, they get two things that they can roll on. The first one is the ruse table, which is going to be similar to the twist table. Um, and then if for some reason the attacker's power level is twice the defenders um, before the game starts, uh, the defender gets to roll on another chart called the sudden death table. Um, so I'll go through all these tables real quick here. So an example of the twist table that the attacker would get um, during the first turn um, this is called Dead of Night. The maximum range of all ranged weapons is limited to 24. Um, oh, this maybe it's not benefits. Um, targets that are further away are not visible during the second turn. Um, it's ah, okay. Limited to 36 inches and then 48 inches and so on. So as basically as the sun is coming up, um, you can actually increase the ranges. So uh, maybe these are not designed for the um, the attacker. They're just the attacker just rolls to see what the the nifty thing is. Um, each time one of your opponent's attachments is destroyed, you generate one command asset. Uh, slay the warlords. Um, each player generates a command asset for each enemy warlord that is not a war master. And oh, and D three command assets for any for an enemy warlord that is a war master that was destroyed in that phase. So these are little things that go on during the game to add a lot more flavor to it. Uh, then we got the ruse table. There's only six items. Um, defender generates one extra command asset during the generate um, during the command asset phase. Um, in any in any turn in which their war master is on the battlefield. Um, another one during the first turn of the damage phase. Um, during the first turn in the damage phase, the defender rolls D12s instead of D6s when making saving throws for any units in their army. Um, then at sudden death, this is the one where it's like if you have the the double, if your attacker, if the attacker has double command or uh, 
double power level for whatever reasons you guys are doing um so defender sudden death victory condition is if uh this condition is met at the end of the battle at least half of the total number of units in the enemy let's see i just totally messed that up this sudden death victory condition is met if at the end of battle at least half of the total number of units in the enemy army have been destroyed um so these are just kind of weird victory conditions that you can earn points on or win the game um interesting so lots of little things there now here's the other cool thing and i'm just about done with this book guys so thank you for bearing with me um they go into war zones and the war zones not war zone houston but war zone uh they got like fog of war firestorm warp storm uh sector imperialis death world forest sector mechanicus wall of martyrs xenos world and that is it um each of these have their own um special rules and you're going to see that as you get through a couple of these well once you get to sector imperialis i think the three basic ones firestorm warp storm and fog of war kind of a generic um war zone but the other ones um play heavily into the games workshop terrain so um it talks about statuary um given bonuses if there are roads um they have those uh, uh i'm not sure what material they use but they have the the little rollout roads that you can add to your to uh to your battlefield or if you have like their uh, maybe you have a tile or that the tiles or maybe a game mat that actually has roads um Yes, Clinton, you missed a lot. Uh, so Death World Forest, um, that's where they're talking about more, those Eldritch runes. And um, you've probably seen the Eldar sets with the Death Forest um, little bits. So basically all these war zones are just talking to you guys or walking you through using the actual um, uh, bits and pieces for the different terrain and actually applying them to your games of uh, apocalypse uh yes i do work tomorrow um let's see here so i mean they're just extra little rules that you can apply that do you have to no uh, but if you guys want to get even crazier with your missions and such and make your own very unique games maybe you have like a full um wall of martyr set or maybe you like um at atomic hobby shop We've got that huge table with all that uh, sector mechanicus stuff. Um, so we could easily make, maybe not on that table, but spread it out and make a uh, sector mechanicus war zone when we do our um, apocalypse, our first apocalypse game at the store. Uh, let me check out the calendar here. I think we're going to be doing it on the 20th, uh, the week after War Zone Houston. Um, we haven't set all the rules yet. But we're kind of going through that. So, then the back of the book, I mentioned earlier, there's about 30 pages. Uh, about half of those pages are in the back where it's just going over the different army types. Um, then there's a snazzy rules reference in the back, um, but you could just download the rules reference from online and print it off. That way you don't have to keep flipping through this book. Uh, since Clint is on and he's a big orc player, I'm going to read what your faction ability is. Um, let's see here. Each time you roll an unmodified hit roll of a six for an attack made by any by an, uh, sorry by an orc unit in this detachment, you can immediately make one additional attack at the same target using the same weapon. And this attack can't generate more. So that's a faction ability for your orcs. So that's really it for this book. Um, the rules are really quick and simple, guys. So. Uh, for those of you who just jumped on, the phase is really easy. You are going, you and your opponent are going to determine initiative. But just do a quick recap. You're going to determine initiative. Um, whoever goes first, um, he is going to, as I look back through the book, um, yeah, uh, you are going to issue your orders. Check to first make sure you're going to see if any of your guys are out of command range, which remember 12 inches. Uh, if they're outside the 12-inch range of your that detachment commander, they are going to be out of command range, and that could end up being bad. Um, and you're going to issue one of those three orders to your detachments, 
And uh, then once you issue an order to a detachment, your opponent does back and forth until all detachments have been issued orders. Then you guys are going to go to the action phase. That's where you'll nominate a unit um, and activate its whatever uh, orders you had given it. That means move and shoot, um, double move and close combat, or shoot and close combat, whatever it is that you want that whole detachment to do. Um, that you're not going back to, you're not doing the, well, it's my turn. I'm going to use this unit first to go to here. I'm going to do all, move all these, and then I'm going to go to my shooting phase and then my charge phase and all that. You're not doing that anymore. You're going to ch choose the entire detachment and execute its order, which is more, more than likely a move and shoot or move in uh, close combat. So once you've activated that detachment, your opponent gets to activate a detachment. Now, during that activation, if you manage to damage your opponent, um, any of your opponent's units, you're going to be putting these little blast markers. Um, if, if that's only if there is no blast markers by it. If there already is, then you're going to upgrade it to a large blast marker. And if you have to add on more blast markers, it'll be, once again, a little one followed by a big one. And these come into play at during the damage phase. So once all your orders are done, you've done all your dice rolling, everybody's moved, follow their orders, it's time for the damage phase. Now, this is done after both you and your opponent have gone through the entire um, uh, activation of your detachments. When there's nothing else to activate, you guys will now do the damage phase. Now you start with, and this is the tricky thing for those, especially those who just jumped on, you're gonna start by, act, you're gonna go to your um, super heavy detachments and you're gonna resolve all the damage for your super heavies because if they explode, they're gonna explode first and there's a good chance that they're gonna damage the units around them and add on more blast markers. And then before you start resolving blast markers, you see if there's any units where they're out of command range and they'll have like a little marker next to them that come in the box. And if they have that marker next to them, they don't have any special ability that allows them to ignore it. Um, before they resolve their damage, they are just routed. They're wiped off the map, they're destroyed. So being a command range is really freaking important. So make sure you guys pay attention to that. And then you start resolving damage. Um, if you've got, uh, for every small blast marker, you're gonna roll a D12. Um, if it's equal to or greater than your armor save, hey, the units survived. If it's, obviously if it's less than, um, they take damage. For the large blast markers, you're gonna be rolling that D6. Uh, so that's where like units like Grotz, who I think, I wanna say are a nine or a 10 uh, armor, maybe worse. You're not gonna be able to make it with a, a D6 roll. That unit's just gonna be wiped out. Um, so just, just keep that in mind, especially when you're building your asset decks, there might be cards in there that allow you to use D12s all of a sudden. For what reason you wanna save a unit of Grotz? Um, I don't know, but maybe you've got a great, great reason to do that. Um, so once you resolve the damage, if the unit has lost all of its wounds, then you're going to pull them off. They're dead, wiped out. If they, um, have taken, taken, um, any wounds, you're going to put a wound marker next to them. And if they're at half their starting wounds, they are going to end up having some negative penalties. Um, they have their, um, they have their uh, attacks reduced, they have minuses to hit, and they're very close to dying. So, and that's where those movement traits are gonna come in handy. Cause like, uh, for example, Space Marines, um, it's a 10 man squad, I think they had two wounds for Primaris Marines. Uh, normally a 10 man squad, it's really 20 wounds, but now they have just have two. And if you have the, on those movement trays, when, if they're at, they take a one wound, um, the unit's not wiped, but half of them, you can just pull half of them off to represent that um, half the unit or that the unit is under strength. Um, and then um, that's where those, mute, those new movement trays are going to come in handy. So you can just pick up the movement tray. You don't have to worry about picking up individual ones. It's going to go by faster, especially you orc and tyranid players and probably you demon players and genestealer cult players. Yeah. All you horde armies, um, I would pick up those trays. 
Uh, it's like forty dollars for the box, and it's anywhere from depending on the size. Um, I think the smallest is eight for forty millimeter. There's twelve at thirty two, and then I think there's eighteen in the twenty five millimeter uh, box. So actually, it's a very good deal to get those uh, movement trays. And then after you get done with your uh, destroying units, you start all over again. Uh, if you've met your victory conditions, then congratulations, the game's probably over uh, two or three hours later, and you guys can either start again or go get something to eat, whatever you guys do, um, bragging rights. So um, take a look at those free data sheets on their webpage, on the, on the Warhammer community page or on the Apocalypse page, so you can kind of get an idea of what to expect with your units. I'll put up a picture here of what... Uh, what you're going to see with their um, data sheets, what I was talking about. Uh, as soon as I can find it here. Holy crap, where is that? Well, maybe I can't. There we go. Uh, that is an example of their data sheet. Um, probably can't see too well, but like I said, go on there uh, to their website and take a look at it because you're, you're going to see a lot of different things, different types of power level. Uh, their entire stat line uh, kind of has some familiar terminology you're used to, like I said, uh, ballistic skill, wounds, leadership, save, but you're going to see different numbers. So going in and expecting Primaris Marines to have a three plus armor save, um, you're wrong. They're going to have a six plus armor save. And that, that means, like I said earlier, if they have a large blast marker, they have to roll a six sider and if they get a six, Hey, they're safe. If it's less than that, they're going to take the wound um, or wounds. Um, but if it happens to be a small blast marker, then they roll D12, and they got a 50-50 chance to not take a damage. Um, then, like I said, you'll see the things with their attacks, um, like the Storm Bolters, one attack. It means you're rolling one dice, uh, not the normal four shots. So uh, it would be interesting to see what uh, units like Ludas, um, who have... I think a 25-man unit of Ludas was putting out 75 shots or something like that. I'm not sure if you can do that anymore, but um, it's going to be interesting to see what a lot of your favorite units who can put out a lot of DACA, a lot of shots, or a lot of close combat attacks, what their actual attack characteristic is now. So uh, it's something that I would definitely look into, kind of familiar, familiarize yourself with. Um, real, the other thing I was gonna, I want to talk about, um, just kind of rehash, is the SAP and SAT. That is the damage for your weapons. The SAP is against personnel, and uh, SAT is against tanks. So you'll see, like the storm bolter I mentioned earlier, um, uh, versus personnel. Um, it's going to wound on a nine plus. Um, versus the versus a tank, it's going to wound on a ten plus. So a little difficult. Um, about thirty to about thirty three to twenty uh, some odd percent chance of actually wounding. So a lot of big differences, guys. Um, but as I'm reading this after playing years and years and years and years of um, playing Apocalypse and Warhammer 40,000 decades. Um, I can say that reading this is, this game is going to play so much faster. Um, I'm going to say you're playing probably, I would say I'm going to, a safe estimate is probably about three times as fast as you did before. So those six hour games are probably going to be about a two hour game, maybe three. I don't know. I, I would say anywhere from uh, two to three times faster. Um, so, yeah. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. It was strength against personnel is SAP. Um, and then strength against uh, tanks is SAT. Um, so things like Gilliman, um, Mortarian, your big giant tanks and everything, those are your SATs, not your test scores, but your strength against tanks. And then strength against personnel are like your grots, your space marines, those sort of things. So... Um, it's, and you're rolling a D12 to wound unless you have something special or detrimental that kind of drops that down. So I'm telling you, this game is going to play very fast. You're going to be able to use all your big toys. And I would even recommend 
before you dive into all the super crazy rules that they have here, um, I would just so you can get familiar with it, I would recommend, highly, highly recommend that you just play uh, a very basic mission. Uh, they actually have it right on page 41, right in the beginning about missions. It's the apocalyptic assault. It is a very, very simple um, beat, beat em up game where um, you are just trying to reduce each other by X amount of power level. Uh, it's basically just kill, it's just a kill mission, but at least gets you familiarized with um, the new way that you uh, issue orders, the way you execute your actions, and then resolve, everybody resolves damage at the end at the same time. Um, which is a good thing because there's nothing worse than the old version of Apocalypse where you sit there and you got this, you know, this gorgeous $2,000 Warlord Titan and your buddy just shot him off the table with his three war, I'm sorry, he has a Warlord and you, you just shot him off the table with uh, three Warhound Titans or whatever. Uh, it's It sucks because you lose your big awesome unit right away without even getting to fire a shot. Now you do. Uh, you still might lose a turn one, but you're still going to be able to dish out the pain back and forth um, before you lose it. So that it, it's it's a cooler feature, guys. So I think that is it. Unless anybody has any questions for me, I'm going to take a drink here, give you guys a chance to ask any questions about Apocalypse. Um, hopefully I can uh, answer it, and or hopefully I already answered your guys' questions. I'm going to tell you right now, Apocalypse is going to be a lot of fun to play. Um, I Is it going to be a game changer? Well, it already is. Um, are people going to flock to it instead of uh, regular 40K match play or narrative play? Mm, no. But you're going to see these games popping up, especially as the tournament season um, kind of dies down. Uh, you'll see the people that don't travel to the events, you're going to start seeing them camping out and hey let's get an apocalypse game um so i got all these new toys that i don't play anymore because the meta keeps shifting with uh, match play and tournaments so now i got all this stuff i'm not using but i want to use it um so apocalypse is going to be cool in fact we might actually add apocalypse to warzone houston next year uh we're gonna i'm, I'm gonna pay attention because we started out with war with uh, apocalypse at clutch city at Comic Palooza, which spawned into Warzone Houston. So um, we might look at that becoming um, a, a new th a thing. That's where Alan and I um, started. So we'll see. But I don't see anybody slamming me with questions. So I guess um, either I did an incredibly good job or um, of describing the game where people fell asleep. Oh, excuse me. Um, so, actually, I guess I'll give you guys a couple minutes here. Um, let's see. Oh, you know what? How about I go through a couple asset cards? Um, let's see here. Since we have an orc player on here, let's talk about an orc special ability. So, you guys aren't going to be worrying about, like I said before, your psych choosing your psychic powers. Or your stratagems. So, um, here's an example: orcs, the uh, psychic power, the jump. Um, it's a command asset. Um, it's a psychic power. You can only include this um, if you have an orc psyker unit. Um, it can be used in the action phase, and when you use it, you select one psyker unit from your army to manifest the power. Then select one friendly unit within 12 inches, and you're not. You don't doesn't look like you have to actually have to roll since these are assets. You usually, don't have to roll for these. Uh, you just remove the unit from the battlefield and set up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches from an enemy unit. So um, you're not making a psychic power check anymore. You are these are just psychic. These are assets. Um, so this kind of adds a different level of play to the game. Um, so here's another one for orcs. Uh, no mucking about. Oh, that's a long one to read. I'm not gonna read that one. Um, lucky blue gets red ones go faster. The old ways. Um, yeah. So it's, a lot of these are actually dependent upon 
um, very specific um, uh, cult, clan cultures. Uh, so kind of cool here. Um, so I don't know how this is going to play out with all the different ones, but, um, and these are, I'm not going to go into these guys. Sorry. There are just so many for me to try to, to tear through here. Uh, Tyranid Hive Fleets, um, asset can be used in the action phase. When used, you select one Leviathan unit from your army. Until the end of that turn, you can reroll hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks made by the unit, and you can reroll saving throws and morale tests for the unit. Um, and alternatively, you can be used after making a wound roll for a Tyranid High Fleet unit from your army. When used, reroll you reroll that wound roll. So, lots of um, neat little tricks in here that you don't even have to roll on. It looks like psychic powers. You're not going to be making uh, the, uh, the normal psychic uh, spend uh, see how many warp charges. You don't have to make a roll. You're just going to burn your command asset. So a little limiting in the way that you, you know, you're not going to be able to constantly uh, use a psychic power over and over and over again. But you are going to be able to have, still have access to them and could come at a clutch moment. So kind of cool. And it, um, the way I'm looking at these assets and the way that this game plays, it's showing the battle on a much larger scale, guys and, and gals, much larger scale than what we're used to. And it's kind of taking a look not so much at the individual actions of each each person, but more um, looking at the detachments as a whole. So the squads as a whole versus, you know, the what that sergeant is doing or what the librarian is doing over there. It's more about um, the bigger picture and I think that's why you are seeing, you're wanting your detachments to be closer together because you want those command benefits um, and be in that command bubble. And um, as you look at the Games Workshop artwork, and this is a big key thing, you see those big um, battle scenes where it's these tight knit groups of warriors side by side, shoulder to shoulder, battling it out against their opponents. And that's kind of the feel that we're getting with Apocalypse is that it's these big, massive units, um, these detachments waging war and clashing, um, their lines clashing head to head versus normal match play, guys, where you are, um, it's more of a small elite detachment. Um, so instead of, say, two, 300 guys, you have maybe 60 guys. And or individual squads and you're waging war over a small um, small battlefield, you know, a couple city blocks, where Apocalypse now, you have these big massive formations, these big massive detachments, whole companies of Marines, you know, 200 Marines, and you're waging war across, you know, an entire city or a massive battlefield. So um, that's where the feel of a lot of this stuff is coming from. So the games are going to be a lot quicker and a lot more there. You're going to lose a little bit of the detail, the individual um, dice rolling that you would for like, say, like I said, um, 75 Luda shots. I know you can't do the, um, the Luda bomb anymore uh, from what Clint said, but uh, so instead of doing all those dice rolls, now it's just like kind of like a big mass attack. Uh, very similar to how Epic played. If you ever played, Warmer 40,000, the epic uh, version of the game. So a lot of cool things that are going to be happening with this, and I think there's going to be more stuff coming down the line. Um, so I think that's about it. I don't see any questions. Uh, so I'm going to pat myself on the back that I did a good job of explaining um, and hope that it's not that people are just not interested <laughs> in Apocalypse. Um, so coming up this weekend, guys, we're going to have a live 24-hour show. As long as our cameras work it might just end up being one camera um and i say 24 hours but i'm going to tell you right now if i have those models all done um in 18 hours then i'm i'm sorry i'm going to probably cut the show uh because i'm going to be tired as heck because i got to turn around um to cover it's my uh, employee's birthday on sunday so i would be going from saturday at 10 a.m all the way to 10 a.m. for the show and then turn around, open the store and work until 6 p.m. So um, no, I'm not gonna talk for six more hours. Um, so 
hopefully, um, to be honest, I hope I do a good job painting and we haven't done in 18 hours or less, or less than 24 hours. But uh, we'll probably keep it going for a good solid amount of time. I think that we might end up having it done by, um, or I should say I will have it wrapped up around five, six o'clock in the morning, which will be great because then I can uh, go to sleep for about six hours, just sleep on the couch in the, in the studio and then wake up and open up my store and work for six hours. Ugh, it's going to be mind boggling awesome. Um, so watch our show because we're going to watch for the link guys on Facebook and our main chat was going to probably be going through Twitch because that's where our donation button is going to be. It's going to be for a veterans organization. It's actually going to be going through the Montrose Center, who just opened up a, um, a division or a department for um, veterans, especially LGBTQIA plus um, veterans, um, helping them get um, housing and getting them jobs and getting them adjusted back to civilian life. So we're going to be helping out um, veterans. And that's all 100% of those proceeds that we get from the donations um, and uh, whatever you guys manage to donate to us, a dollar, five dollars, $150,000, I don't care. Um, the more the better because it's helping out somebody else. Like I said, it's 100% goes to them. The proceeds for the Army that we're going to be auctioning off at uh, Warzone Houston will go to the Montrose Center itself. Um, mainly for uh, youth and at-risk or at-risk uh, youths. Um, we really want to take care of our community here in Houston. So um, make sure you watch that show because we're going to be doing all sorts of crazy things. We got we're pro looks like we're going to have a couple of games going on. We're going to be painting. Um, oh, the Army, Kevin. Um, we're doing a Blades of Corn Army. Um, the centerpiece is, uh, see if I can get it. Uh, there's a dragon from Forge World called Borgath, Borgrath, something like that. Here is the main body for the dragon. Um, you can see it's quite massive. There's a uh, can. Um, I've shown this off a couple times. It's now cleaned. Um, I'm going to be pinning it probably uh, tomorrow and Friday, and then it'll be ready to go for Saturday's paint session. Uh, then we have another big, I think it's Scrax or Scarx or something like that, that big uh, um, corn demon for, for Age of Sigmar. Um, ten Blood Warriors, I think that's what they're called, and then five uh, Flesh Hounds. It's a small army, but it's got these large centerpiece models. Um, it's really in a good position for you, whoever wins it, to not only have a centerpiece for their army, whether they use that dragon in the gameplay or not, but also a nice starting point for them to really get into it, into Age of Sigmar with the 2000 point army, fully fully based and painted. So we're excited about that. Um, Ski and I are gonna be the ones that are primarily gonna work on it. We might have a couple of guest um, artists jumping in, but yeah, that's for Warzone Houston. We'll be auctioning that off right before we do our award ceremony on July 14th. So. Please, guys, I'd really appreciate um, if you could help us out with the donations. Like I said, a dollar is extremely helpful. Um, you know, don't buy a soda this week or don't go to McDonald's, you know, send $5. Um, it's it's not for us. It's not for the studio. It's not for the Patreon support. It is strictly for uh, the Veterans Association uh, down at the Mantra Center. We really want to help out our vets. We want to really help out our community here. So please take that into consideration. It might not seem like a dollar, but if we have, we have like 3,000 uh, followers, 3,000 subscribers, if we even had like a half of those people or even a quarter of those people jump on and uh, donate a dollar, it's almost a thousand dollars that we have to help somebody out. Um, that could be a new, um, uh, maybe paying off some bills or get them some, um, awesome clothes and get them all cleaned up for um, a job interview, uh, getting them groceries, getting food in their belly, getting them to their medical care. I mean, there's so much stuff that that $1 from each of you could really help out. So please, please watch out for the donation button and our live stream on Saturday. Um, I think I'm done rambling. Um, 
I'm probably not done my rambling, but I think I'm going <laughs> to let you all go. I really appreciate you guys watching. Uh, all our Patreon supporters, thank you very, very much uh, for all of you that watched out tonight. Um, thank you uh, putting up with me and talking about Apocalypse and unboxing it. Um, I'm looking forward to playing it. And if you are in a local area, come on down to Atomic Hobby Shop. Uh, we are going to have uh, lots of these Apocalypse, uh, the asset cards, the game, uh, the, the box that I showed you, and the 20th. Saturday the 20th, I believe, is when we are going to be having our first um, official Apocalypse game there. We're going to be doing it over three tables. I think it's the way it's shaped. It's going to be 12 by, um, nope, sorry, 8. Let me do some math here. It's going to be 14 by 6. Yeah, 14 by 6. It's going to be a massive, massive battle. So um, if you get a chance, come on down. Watch for the rules on our on Atomic Coffee Shop's uh, Facebook page or FNP. Um, I really appreciate it, guys. Y'all have a good night.